we're at a point in time where we can look back at 150 years of history of chemistry and celebrate the amazing things that we've been able to do. You know, we've got a litany of Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics and medicine. We've got these Herculean, you know, individuals and companies and universities that have been pushing the frontiers of science to do amazing things. And if you think back at, at how things have evolved, you know, my God, you know, 30 years when I was when I was an undergraduate a long time ago, when I think about um, things, you know, the music that I was listening to was on these plastic records. OK, the um, medicines that were available weren't so good. I actually lost my, my closest friend to leukemia while I was in college. Um, the materials that we had, you know, think of the computing. You know, my cell phone has more computational power now than what the mission control for the Apollo space program had. Now here we are 30 years later and I'm listening to music on MP3 players. Had my friend got the form of leukemia that he got, now he has a 99% chance that he would have been cured. And the computational you know, instruments and devices are just phenomenal. We are, are evolving in a staggering pace and it's making the world a better place. The quality of life, the quality of the ability of people to pursue their dreams. We're, we're living off of all of these technologies. Strangely, for whatever reason, and this isn't an epic battle of good and evil, it's just there's only so much people can do, we've always taken the, 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 the perspective that molecules are a mysterious group of things and that they do things in sometimes dangerous ways and that to be on the frontier of science, there is a certain amount of risk. And what we have to do is tame the beast, so to speak, so that when we convert these wild and crazy molecules into products to serve society, we have that added need to do it in a way that protects them. So that if we have a, a very acidic solution that's in a battery in a car, well, we got to make sure that that battery is so good that, that that acid will never leak out of it. So if we have a hazardous material in our product, we have to do, you know, Herculean things to make sure that we protect the people that are going to be using that product by, by limiting that exposure. If we have acid in a battery, we got to make sure that that acid never gets out of the battery. If we have a reagent in the manufacturing process, we've got to make sure that it's long gone before it's out, it's out in, the, in the public being used. And that's caused added expense to our process, but we've paid the price of it because, of course, we want to keep people safe. Now, this all happened because we were so focused on making these products. The revolution that is green chemistry is to say, well, you know what? In the last few decades, the field of mechanistic toxicology has evolved, too. We can now look at a molecule and we can say to ourselves, oh, because this molecule has a certain shape, it might be a carcinogen. We can now look at a molecule and say, oh, because it looks like this, this might be an ozone depleter. We're now learning how molecules interact with nature at a deep technical level. We couldn't do this 30 years ago. This is something that's very new. And so what we need to do now is merge these two sciences. And as we invent new materials and new products, now, and I would argue only now can we now start saying to ourselves, how do we make the product so we don't have to have exposure controls because it's fundamentally safe in the first place? Now, that's a tall order. That's, you know, sometimes people think about, oh, yeah, you should do that. And they want us to snap our fingers and do that overnight. And the problem is, is that you can't snap your fingers and do that overnight. This is going to take decades of research, decades of experimentation to learn how to do this. This is something that you don't just do because you want to. We have to invent these technologies. We have to expend money doing R&D. We have to be patient the way that it took, like I said, 150 years to get to where we are today. It could take another 100 years to get to where we need to be. So we've got to celebrate incremental improvement wherever possible and recognize that the enemy of the excellent is the perfect. But we've got to be patient. We've got to realize that we can't do this overnight. And the sad reality is, is there are people who are getting sick that need the medicines today. There 
There are people who are hungry who need the technologies to feed them today. There are materials that are required in our society today, and we don't have all the answers yet. So we're going to have to depend on exposure controls for some period of time. But we can never be happy leaving the story there. This is where the next generation of scientists have to learn the technologies of safe science, of green chemistry, and get out there and invent those new materials. Truly, when you think about it, if you think about sustainability and you imagine some student somewhere and some student said, I want to save the world. Right now, the last thing that student's going to think is that they should be a chemist if they want to save the world. And the sad reality is we've got to let them understand that that is the way to save the world. We need people that have dreams, that have visions, that have ideas that are going to change the world in the laboratory with the beakers and the flasks to make molecules that are going to be safe. That's green chemistry. My name is John Warner. I'm the President and Chief Technology Officer of the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry.